In this video, we're going to focus on looking at the derivative of a function, not necessarily the derivative at a specific point. The idea being, if we can create the derivative function, then we could evaluate that function at any point along the domain. The definition we'll be using for the derivative is the limit as h goes to 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x over h. This is the first derivative of f, and importantly is that this derivative function outputs the rates of change of the original function. What the rates of change statement means differs by functions, but it's really easy to figure out what the units of that derivative function are. Let me show you a quick example. In this example here, we're given f of t, which is negative 16t squared plus 80t plus 6, where t in this case, by the way, is an input of seconds, and f of t is outputting height in feet. We're being asked to find the first derivative and then state the units of that derivative. We're going to take this definition of the derivative, apply it to this function, and find the first derivative function. All right, to find the derivative of this function right here, all I need to do is plug in this function right here into this formula. So the first derivative is the limit as h goes, h goes to 0 of f of x plus h. In this case, it's going to be t plus h because my independent variable here is t minus f of t. Let me write it all down and we'll talk it through. All right, here I've plugged this function into the definition of the first derivative here. Now what my job is, is to clean this up as much as possible. Always with these polynomials, the main issue is going to be this term right here, or that factor of t plus h squared. We need to remember that's t plus h times t plus h and expand that out. I'm going to do all of that, expand all of this out, and then show you the next steps. Now our job is to clean things up after we've distributed, multiplied everything through. Let's combine like terms. We'll often have these terms that cancel in the numerator. For instance, this negative 16t squared and the positive 16t squared cancel each other out. Uh, we have the a plus 80t minus 80t. And finally, the plus 6 and the minus 6 all cancel each other out. Let's now rewrite this without those terms. All right, now what we're going to do is we're going to cancel a factor of h between the numerator and denominator. By the way, this is the entire hope for this problem. The reason we couldn't evaluate this limit in the beginning was because our denominator was going to zero. If we can somehow cancel out this factor of h in the denominator, then we have no issues computing this limit. So if I cancel a factor of h between the numerator and each, each term in the numerator, excuse me, and the denominator. That's equivalent, as always, to factoring out a factor of h and then canceling it with the denominator. What I'm left with then is a 1 in the denominator. And in the numerator here, what I have, as h goes to 0, I have negative 32t minus 16h plus 80. Finally, now I can actually apply this limit to this expression right here. I can let h go to 0 because there's no issues with dividing by 0. And when I do that, as h goes to 0, I plug in a 0 for this term right here. And this term then becomes 0, giving me that f prime of t equals negative 32t plus 80. All right then, we found our first derivative of this function, f of t. To remind you, f of t was this position function which in which we inputted time and we got out vertical height in terms of feet. The question is, is what is this function telling us? By the way, we always call these equations position functions because we input a time and we're given out a position, in this case, a vertical height. This function right here has to always have the same input. So this t value right here is still in terms of seconds. The question is, is what is the output of this derivative function? And that's always an easy question to answer. It is the rate of change of the original function or in other words, it's the ratio of the outputs to the inputs. That's exactly what this is finding, right? This is the change in the outputs over the change in the inputs. Therefore, this function, all it is doing is outputting those rates. In this term, in this, in this problem, it's feet per second. And I put a button on this real fast. Is this, if the original function is this position function, then the first derivative, which is the rate of change, is then the velocity function.
All right, before we go back to the position velocity function, I want to step back and talk about the notation of derivatives. We have here the definition of a derivative as the limit as h goes to zero is of f of x plus h minus f of x over h. Let's look at now a graphical representation with the h in this case. We previously described this in terms of x approaching a. But now you can see this with this h represents. Letting h go to zero are these, these two arbitrary points meeting together into one. As the h goes to zero, it means the distance between those two points goes to zero. Also to point out from the graphical representation is what we're doing here, right? In the numerator, we're finding the vertical distance or the change in the outputs, and we're dividing by the h which is the difference of the inputs of the function. Notation-wise, another way of writing this would be to say we're taking the limit as the change in x goes to zero, um, and we're taking the ratio of the change in y over the change in x. In fact, Leibniz notation is exactly saying something like this. It's the change in y over change in x, which is the same thing as the rate of change or the slope of a function. But the Leibniz notation would write that as dy dx. The dy dx is almost the same as the change in y over the change in x, except for dy dx is making the statement these, these are infinitesimally small changes, meaning we're letting the difference in the x values get so minutely small, and that means the difference in the y's will get minutely small, and then we have this idea of instantaneous rate of change. Generally speaking, the prime notation was originated by Newton, and this notation was originated by Leibniz. You'll see throughout calculus, we will use both these notations for different reasons, but they mean exactly the same thing. In the Newton notation, we'll do things with these primes to indicate derivatives. So like f prime or y prime would be the first derivative. In Leibniz notation, we'll do stuff just like this. We dy dx, or we could have df dx, or even a third way of talking about the first derivative would be, be to say, take you're differentiating the f of x function. By the way, one important powerful use of Leibniz, and we'll see this later this quarter, is that when you're differentiating with this notation, it tells you the variable you're taking that with respect to. That's not really a big deal in early calculus. We'll be dealing with one variable functions, but as you'll see very soon, we'll have multivariable functions, or we'll introduce the idea of implicit differentiation for things like parametric equations, and it'll be very important with which, which variable you're differentiating with respect to. We want to indicate a second derivative with the Newton notation. We just would say something like f double prime of x or y double prime. In the Leibniz notation, we will do this. We'll say d squared dx squared of, of then for y, or you could put an f there, or we could use this more as a, a function or operator notation like this. Again, the statement being these are the same types of notation. You'll see reasons for both of them. Generally speaking, for me, I like the Leibniz notation. It's, it's a, it clarifies things. It lets you understand this idea that the, the derivative is always a ratio. Though, honestly, the Newton notation in many applications is just quick and easier to deal with. All right, now going back to that first example we talked about at the beginning of the video, let's just talk about these functions. I've actually given the second derivative of our position function, and let's talk about the outputs, and then let's look at a graphical representation of these relationships. First of all, let's talk about the output. This position function is going to output feet. It, you input seconds, and it outputs feet. The first derivative we've already discussed, this is the velocity function. This is the rate of change of the first function. This outputs feet per second. This is telling you at any given time how the feet are changing, or the rate of change is the feet in terms of seconds. The set third derivative, or the derivative of the velocity, is telling you how the velocity is changing. As I've noted here, this is the acceleration function. 
I haven't shown the work on how to do this, but just to quickly talk about why this makes sense as a derivative, right? The derivative, graphically speaking, is the slope at any point. Well, the slopes are changing on this original position function because it's this parabolic, this upside down concave parabola. Um, for this, so this, this is describing how those slopes are changing. But if you're going to describe how these slopes or how the slopes of the velocity is changing, well, this is just a linear equation with the slope of negative 32. So when you find the derivative with the derivative formula, you'll get this constant function of negative 32. What this means is that the acceleration of the original object is changing consistently, or excuse me, the velocity is changing consistently. The units for the acceleration function are exactly the same thing as we found in the first. To find the rate of change of the first one, we take the outputs and divide by the inputs. In this case, it's the same way. The units are feet per second per second. Or another way of writing this, by the way, this is how it makes most sense. But the shorthand for this would be feet per second squared. And before we move on to the graphical representation, I just want to break down how this makes sense. This is how the velocity or the feet per second are changing every second. Every second, the velocity is decreasing or going more negative by 32 feet per second. All right, now if we look at the graphical representation here, first with the position function, right? We have this starting point, this y-intercept of six. We then are increasing at 80 feet per second, at least at first, but the effect of gravity is bringing this back down. So the ball reaches this peak and then comes back to the ground. That said, again, it had this initial force that was going up that's reacting to the force of gravity. If we now impose the, the uh, velocity function, you'll see that it's this negative sloped linear equation that goes through the middle of this. Again, what that is representing, that the outputs or the y values of that function are representing the, the speeds of this ball. Importantly to notice is where this line is zero. This line is zero at the very peak. That makes sense because this ball has an upward trajectory or has a positive velocity, then at some point, gravity is winning the battle from the initial velocity of going upwards. At that point, there's an instantaneous point when our, our velocity is zero before our velocity begins to be negative. As our velocity goes to be negative, you can see then that the velocity line is now in the negative portion of the y-axis. Finally, if we back up and then now look at this acceleration function, it's kind of hard, I think, to see what this is saying. But as we'll talk about later, if you see this acceleration function down here at negative 32, what this is saying is the change in velocity is consistent. And that's actually what gives the parabola its shape right there. Because from the very beginning, your object is slowing down, or in other words, it, it's going more negative because of the effect of this acceleration. A little hint for the future, when you have a negative second derivative, it means your original function had this concavity or this concave down shape. 